Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and begin. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. It looks like we've got a, a good dozen or so. Uh, I'm Clay Walker, chair of the Lecture Steering Committee. Welcome to this is uh, the fourth of our self care series, which uh, was really started by Kristen Cazetta, who's here with us and uh, Christine Knapp. I don't think she's around yet, though. I think she's still teaching until for a few more minutes. So, um, so today's uh, instance here of the self care. Oh, I wanted to say the self care series is uh, an initiative that we started because we wanted to create uh, a way for people at the university to come together and to interact without an agenda. You know, we, we, you know, in a way that's uh, generative and productive for ourselves and for our well-being, especially as we're all kind of together isolated here in these Zoom meetings. So um, with to that end, uh, I'm happy to welcome our uh, facilitator today, uh, Dr. Carolyn Mon from the English department. Uh, and... Uh, Carolyn is going to be uh, leading a workshop on, um, I think the title of this talk, this, this presentation is Writing for Meaning. And this, uh, I'll just say, relates to other work that she's been doing, um, also part of the working group with her on writing and resilience. And in that working group, resilience broadly means, we think of it as, uh, you know, includes several facets of mental well-being, persistence and goals, survival, wellness, recovery, and adaptability in the face of adversity. So I think this is a great, uh, a great addition to the series that we, the previous versions we've had that have addressed other aspects of well-being. And so I'm looking forward to hearing more uh, and hope you are too, and uh, using writing for, uh, you know, creating meaning and dealing with the times that we're in. So with that, Carolyn, thanks again. Welcome. And uh, the, uh, the uh, stage is yours. Kristen, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for doing this series. It sounds marvelous. Uh, it's wonderful whenever we can speak uh, out loud about well-being and wellness. Uh, I'm hoping that that's something that will carry through after the pandemic at the level that we need it to and have always needed it to. Um, uh, my area is uh, American literature and I've uh, done scholarship in early 20th century American women writers and I'm also a creative writer. And so what brings me here today is my primarily my interest in creative writing, although what I do in literature also relates to this because uh, the, the women writers that I study uh, suffered some consequences to their career because of uh, disability. And uh, so that's kind of unconsciously per perhaps what drew me to them in the first place, but it's something that a uh, thread that I followed. And it seems like different things that I've done uh, have kind of converged on some of the issues that I'm going to share with you today. So um, I'm going to uh, share my slides with you. I hope that they won't be distracting, but maybe that you could refer to them later because they have um, they have live links in them that you could look at uh, on your own as well if you find some things that you want to revisit. And I'm also going to, um, I'm not going to go through every slide. I'm going to talk through them, but uh, I want to share a few with you. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And there you all are. Okay, so um, basically, I just wanted to show you the outline uh, that I planned for today. Um, basically, I want to give you some information and background on writing and resilience as the working group, uh, where the conversations that took place have kind of led to uh, the activity for today. I want to talk a little bit about why I'm motivated to study expressive writing and health. So you'll have a little bit of my background. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, expressive writing in clinical practice. And I'm going to pause for a second. Expressive writing just in general means uh, write, um, writing without 
uh, self-consciousness about spelling or grammar uh, for a period of time, sometimes over several days uh, for maybe 10, 20, or 30 minutes at a time. And then, um, you know, kind of encountering or engaging with your emotions on a particular topic. So that's kind of a brief uh, description of what that means. And I'm going to draw our attention to uh, the Pandemic Project, which is a, um, a website that's part of a, a research group uh, led by a psychologist named uh, Jamie Pettabaker. And there are some resources there that I want to point you to. Um, at about 20 to 25 minutes in, perhaps sooner than that, I'll invite you to write expressively. So as a workshop, you'll have an opportunity, it'll be about 10 minutes or so to try this and see uh, if it's something that could be valuable to you. If you prefer to write with a pen and paper rather than on a screen, then you may want to look for some pen and paper. And then we'll have some time for follow-up and discussion. So, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Writing and Resilience Group Working Group. It uh, began in fall of 2019, and it is sponsored by the Humanities. And kind of a core group of uh, faculty have been talking about um, just kind of doing background reading in kind of the clinical research on uh, expressive writing and its health, but also other kinds of wellness outcomes. And I just needed to have more background in it um, because I wanted to, you know, to think more about why creative writing is so popular. Um, it is one of the big, you know, one of the things that we can reliably see enrolling uh, people you know are motivated to write creatively in a number of different modes and that's always been um, really interesting to me my own background is that I was writing creatively from a very young age and many people who do you know are novel writers or poets or what have you have done it from an early age and um, anyway it's there's a lot of mysteries there for me so we've re really focused on um looking at practices, uh, how kind of the clinical literature uh, has developed and uh, the relationship of, you know, resilience, well-being, um, all of those things that, that Clay just mentioned, being adaptable, being flexible, being able to kind of shift and, and pivot um, are all part of that. So, so basically some of the things that we've worked um, to explore are, uh, you know, what are the resonances between like a creative writing practice and this, um, this kind of clinical practice that's emerged in the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, some, of the, um, some of the researchers in this group are interested in this as a kind of a low cost uh, alternative intervention for different populations, you know, um, people who are dealing with high stress situations, uh, acute, acute um, situations could find some relief uh, with this. And, um, you know, it's just kind of a, a wide variety of, uh, of backgrounds. So one of the people who's in our group is a creative writer and her name is Kelly Forden and she's a Detroit uh, area writer who's uh, really done some outstanding work in writing about uh, adversity and trauma uh, she, she did a chat book. Um, unfortunately, I think it's sold out now, but it's called The Witness. And she interviewed uh, survivors of, um, of sexual abuse connected to the church and wrote poems that represented their experience. So she was writing about, about characters that were composite uh, that was based on testimony. And it's an incredibly powerful piece of work. Um, she also has written a lot of short fiction that uh, that really captures kind of these these pivotal moments where a crisis happens and you can can see people uh, responding to it and changing. So some of her work um, is fiction and some of it is poems. Her most recent book of poetry is called, called Goodbye Toothless House, and uh, it's it's wonderful. And I have the answer is her latest uh, work of short fiction. 
and it is published by Wayne State University Press. So I, I, she's been a, a wonderful member of the group. She's also led workshops in trauma writing and has uh, experience in doing that. Uh, Steffi Hartwell, uh, Dean of um, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and her background is in sociology. She's part of the group, and she is in particular interested in um, whether there's, you know, some opportunities for bringing expressive writing techniques to uh, populations that she works with, uh, particularly ones that are transi transitioning uh, from incarceration and in institutions. So, and she's. Uh, She's got kind of widespread interest in not only writing, but also in art and art therapy for those populations. Uh, I need to mention Mark Lumley in psychology, who has had a long and very fruitful career in researching um, expressive written disclosure and uh, tracking health outcomes. And they can be, you know, people who have a variety of different issues, uh, IBS, uh, depression. Uh, he's worked with uh, refugees um, to try to process uh, recent experiences that are traumatic. And um, he has, you know, kind of let us know in his review of the literature that this kind of technique provides uh, reliable and modest help. So it's not, you know, it's not a silver bullet. It can be a complementary uh, approach that one uses with other other things to um, to promote wellness so um, but there's significant results so that's um, intriguing and um, he's been working on you know how to improve the outcomes and embed the uh, written written expressive disclosure in therapy models so his uh, body of work is is really uh, you know, this very substantial and has been, it's been great to be able to have him in the room and to kind of clear up questions about, about, you know, what he's doing and uh, his goals. So, um, and I wanted to mention uh, another English professor, Richard Marbach, who's a part of the group and his, um, his current project that's of, that connects to this is uh, working with several other faculty members at different universities to create a Flint Water Stories project, which um, encourages uh, people who were affected by that tragedy to, um, to tell their stories and to do it, uh, you know, kind of an internet format and um, process some of that, but also to be advocates uh, for, for change and for accountability. Uh, and I wanted to mention Clay, who joined our group this year, and um, your areas are you know, interdisciplinary research and writing that's informed by cognitive linguistics and literacy studies. Um, and your, you know, this connects to your work on uh, Che Guevara and also the work you do in the classroom. Uh, so I'm so happy to have you in that group. My own um, areas, as I mentioned before, are creative writing and poetry, uh, also disability and literature. So those are things that are kind of a big nexus for me. Um, I also, in my own writing, have been um, unwittingly <laughs> practicing self-disclosure uh, with regard to adversity and, tra and trauma. So that's something that's happened from an early age. I can remember, uh, you know, the kind of writing that I did was so dangerous or threatening <laughs> that uh, I had to ask uh, my, my parents for a locking file cabinet when I was still really very young. And uh, for whatever reason, I found my way to writing as a way to overcome things. And that's stuck with me all these, many other things have changed as we all change over time, but that's stuck with me. That's, I'm compelled even in my busiest moments to still do the writing and still send it out, still share it, uh, and do it in a way that doesn't hurt myself. Uh, and ha that took me a long time to figure out. So um, I've also been, uh, you know, uh, I would say probably about midlife, you know, uh, as a, a woman, things uh, sometimes change uh, for health. And hopefully most people don't, you know, have big major changes. But one of the things that was mysterious is I had a mysterious uh, increase of physical pain uh, right around midlife. And uh, I went through a long, 
a long medical journey, uh, the end of which, you know, uh, you're on the, I don't know, what floor of Henry Ford Hospital and the top neurologist tells you, uh, you are feeling physical pain because of a trauma that happened, you know, 30 years ago. So that was, uh, I had a lot of cognitive dissonance about that. And so part of my motivation for figuring all of this out is to make sense of that. So um, I have been greatly assisted in pain management by expressive writing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, some of our goals of the group are to just read, for me, just to read and discuss the clinical literature with experts, uh, to do this interdisciplinary thinking, to think about how uh, some of the research models in psychology could be transferred or adapted to the creative writing classroom because there's very little discussion or, um, you know, uh, there's very little that's published about kind of creative writing and health. So that's a goal of mine, but I am definitely um, at the kind of near the beginning, I mean, not at the very beginning, but near the beginning of kind of a longer journey with regard to this uh, research. And so uh, one of the uh, short-term goals is to develop a team taught uh, course or probably not team taught, but it'll be a course that in which I bring in guests to kind of uh, talk through some of the, uh, the background on the interdisciplinary uh, material. So uh, I wanted to say just a couple of uh, more things about, um, about like what I discovered about exp expressive writing. As I mentioned, I kind of came to the, the end of a medical journey um, with uh, you know, significant pain that was not tied to tissue damage. And uh, there was very little that a neurologist could do. And in fact, I felt like the system uh, kind of dropped me in, a, in an unproductive way uh, at that point. And so I did not know that there was a whole lot of research and very good doctors who work with people who have these issues and that they're real and that they're not, um, it's not uh, a source of blame. For the person it's you know it's stigmatized you know but it shouldn't be at all and so um i was able to locate you know just because i'm uh, an incessant googler uh an application for my phone and uh called curable and um the the approach to this is multifold. it gives uh, a number of information resources about what is sometimes called mind body pain and you get a lot of, of, of good research delivered through the app. You have uh, meditations and there are expressive writing exercises that kind of probe sort of, you know, uh, perhaps the original experiences or the originary experiences that may be causing this pain over time. Um, it also helps with, uh, I don't know, sort of disrupting if pain and feeling pain or, or illness have become central or core to a person's identity, they help with kind of releasing that um, and maybe, you know, kind of uh, moving, moving on to other things. And so I, um, within several weeks, was able to reduce the amount of pain that I feel and I have been much better. Since then, it is a, of lasting benefit to me. I continue to use the app because uh, there's a lot of wellness um, that's that's in that app for me. I'm able to get it. I'm very suggest, I, I'm very receptive to the kind of kind of things that they offer, and it may not be uh, as effective for everybody, but um, for me, it was worth a try, and it has worked uh, quite well. It led me to. Um, uh, Howard Schubiner, who is an author uh, that has done a lot of work and has also been a colleague and collaborator with Mark Lumley. And he was um, one of the people who, um, you know, was uh, central to the apps development, the curable apps development. And he uh, used to work at Wayne State and then went into private practice and now is in private practice in Southfield. So um, it, let me type in the name of the app. Curable. So um, anyway, I, we are inviting uh, Howard Schubiner, who's sort of, a, you know, um, one of the more productive and uh, scholars of mind-body syndrome, to speak in April 
virtually uh, at the Citizenship Studies Conference. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting to know him better in that context. Uh, so I have uh, like some of my central research questions. Uh, I've you know talked about like why the compulsion to write. Uh, why did why did writing seem to relieve some of uh, some of the issues? I'm also interested in like the efficacy of some of these um, methods. And uh, a couple of years ago, I taught a course on creative writing and the body, and a lot of the readings that we did. Uh, were health related. And so that's, um, I got a lot of really good feedback from students in that seminar. So um, I'm going to pause for a second and just kind of shift to discussing a little bit about or giving you a little bit of background about expressive writing and clinical practice. Um, James Pennebaker, as I mentioned before, is a, a central figure in this. Um, he really, uh, you know, kind of struck on a formula for how to facilitate this kind of writing and has stuck with it. It's been modified, you know, to different situations or whatever, but pretty much um, he concluded that, um, you know, people who do undertake this kind of writing uh, see some results. And he did, you know, double blind uh, and with control group studies and the control groups uh, tended to write about neutral topics like time management or study skills for the same amount of time. And then, and then um, others would have um, this prompt, and I'll go ahead and reshare. So the basic assignment would be like this. And you know, these are college students that have volunteered to be part of this research and they uh, you know, have informed consent and they don't know if they're gonna be in a control group or not. The control group, as I mentioned, is writing about study skills or what have you, something that's kind of emotionally neutral. And then um, the students who are uh, the subjects who are doing the expressive writing would have this sort of prompt. For the next, this would be about you know, 15 to 30 minutes over three days. Uh, he would say, I would like you to write about your very deepest thoughts and feelings about an extremely important emotional issue that's affected you in your life. In your writing, I'd like you to really let go and explore your deepest emotions and thoughts. You might tie your topic to your relationships with others, including parents, lovers, friends, or relatives to your past, your present, or your future, or to who you have been who you would like to be or who you are now. You may write about the same general issues or experiences on all days of writing or on different topics each day. It's completely confidential. Don't worry about spelling, sentence structure or grammar. The only rule is that once you begin writing, continue to do so until your time is up. And so um, I would say that the the findings were, you know, that basically uh, people are initially uncomfortable about writing about topics like that. And so there's a sad uh, feeling afterwards. But uh, he tracked physicians' visits for the students. You know, they, they uh, gave permission for him to do that as part of the experiment. And physicians' visits drop uh, over a period of time, uh, which lasts up to a year afterwards. And uh, they have done this study where they also draw blood and test immune function and find that immune markers are better after this. And these are a number of different studies over a number of different years. Uh, people self-report improvements in mood. And for students, he's also done grade studies and tracked improvements in grades. Again, like I said, this is these are modest uh, but significant uh, results. And uh, if people can't write or don't want to write, they also did studies where people talk into a tape recorder. Um, and it may be that it's uh, more effective to write over several days, even if it's for five to 10 minutes. So, um, I mean, that was uh, it's a very interesting, you know, kind of uh, experimental design. Uh, they had different theories about why this works. Um, initially, they thought it was because if you disclose this information in some form, then you kind of relieve an inhibition that might be kind of an active psychological work that you do. 
to kind of keep, you know, keep things uh, uh, secret or quiet or, or what have you. But that didn't really pan out um, as far as uh, a theory about why this works. It's not proven. Um, there's a maybe a better uh, rationale for why it works in saying that when we organize these experiences into writing, we, we um, change our relationship to, to them and uh, find you know, some insight or think about why things are the way they are. We may be able to grasp causes in a way that um, allows us to be free, freer from rumination. And that um, seems more likely. And he did notice that moving from like kind of poorly organized writing to more coherence is a sign that this is going to, or is correlated with it working better. So as people are writing, kind of doing this kind of first messy draft of something that may never uh, be written into a better draft, and that's okay, that's not what the point is. The point is that you kind of move toward uh, insight. So um, at this point, I wanted to just draw, yourself, draw your attention to the pandemic project, and I'm gonna put the, the link in the um, chat. Oh, thank you for mentioning uh, Bessel van der, van der Kolk, a trauma expert wrote in The Body Keeps the Score on being, uh, a, has a great podcast interview with him. Okay, that's really good information. Thank you for dropping that in, uh, Anna. So the Pandemic Project is also um, a project by James Pennebaker and um, I'll share the screen to talk through it. Basically, they were already very active and doing this kind of uh, research about trauma and when the pandemic struck and so they were able to respond quickly and get this out there. And so they have a, um, a survey and they also have resources uh, for how to feel better about certain aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And they um, have uh, writing prompts where it says try expressive writing. So I'll talk a little bit about a couple of different things. Um, the survey itself is now in its fifth version. Uh, they've surveyed more than 15,000 people. And so the kinds of um, results that they've found uh, are based on kind of a broad participatory um, cohort. And they're able to track certain um, attitudes and thoughts and feelings over time. So they're using um, a software program that Pennebaker developed that helps read the mood of writing. And so it looks for particular kinds of words and does an analysis, whether they're like first person words or words that are associated with negative emotions or positive emotions. And this has been a pretty powerful tool. So the survey prompt is quite similar to the um, prompt I just read you. So if you took the survey, uh, there's a couple of general questions uh, that you go through and then you are invited to write for about five minutes. And they say, unlike the usual questionnaire, we really want you to know, we really want to know what you're thinking, feeling and experiencing in your own words. If you don't wanna write, skip it, but it would be helpful to get a sense of your own personal experiences at this point in the outbreak. In this section, really let go and explore your thoughts and feelings related to the coronavirus outbreak and its effects on your life once you begin writing write continuously for about five minutes without worrying about grammar or spelling. And uh, some of their results have been um, interesting. They, well, they provide particular kind of analysis. Uh, they will, based on this small piece of writing in your survey uh, responses, they will kind of give you feedback on how connected you are socially uh, or if you're I more isolated than other people are. Um, they'll give you feedback about how, uh, you know, how much doom scrolling and obsession about COVID uh, you have. They, they do emphasize it's important to have good information, but they can track or they can kind of uh, sense uh, in some cases if people are uh, spending 
too much time uh, with that information. And whoops. And they also um, provide feedback on healthy habits like exercise and uh, eating well, spending time on hobbies, connecting with other people. And uh, they also have some information about COVID related anxiety. So um, in their blog, uh, which is kind of adjunct to their um, to the site, and I will also put this into our chat, uh, they have you know a number of different analyses, and it is really interesting to see you know sort of like what they're able to to determine from this survey. So uh, like one example, one brief example is you know the percentage of people with or without children who reported that certain areas of their life have been affected a lot or a great deal by the pandemic. And so you can kind of track uh, with children in the household or no children in the household that um, you know aspects of education is obviously very uh, much more affected, but daily routine work patterns. The people who are juggling um, those home responsibilities they found also uh, feel maybe more obligation to care for others at work, even you know, in our present circumstances. So that was kind of an, a surprising finding. Anyway, there's a load of insight in that um, in that website, uh, the the blog, and they basically have tracked things over time. So they have kind of you know tracked the responses to um, the murder of George Floyd and the protest movement through the summer the pandemic lockdown, uh, and it's just really very interesting. So um, they also have uh, expressive writing prompts in their site and um, where it says try expressive writing. And so uh, I'm inviting us to spend about 10 minutes or so um, responding. Now you could do this on their site, but if you find that you don't want to do that, that's okay. I would just open up uh, a Word document if you like to, or pull out a pen and paper. And the, the goal here is to, um, to really try to delve into with the prompt, you know, with the prompts direction, uh, your kind of personal feelings about it and the personal impact. And I've decided that a good place to do this would be the thoughts and feelings about COVID-19. But you see that there are more prompts and there are a number of different uh, approaches. So if you see something there, if you're interested in working with the site, you can pick something else that might be more specific to things that you're, you're dealing with or that you want to prioritize. But this one, um, this one I think is very productive. So we'll do um, 10 minutes. And the instructions are, and I've got them on my PowerPoint and I'll put them up, but for the next five to 10 minutes or longer, if you like, really let go and explore your deepest thoughts and feelings about the COVID-19 outbreak. How is it affecting you and the people around you? How is it related to other significant experiences in your life? Or how are you dealing with feelings such as anxiety or isolation? Really try to address those issues most important and significant to you. So I'm going to So we'll do this together. And uh, I also wanted to add, many people report that after writing, they sometimes feel a little sad or depressed. This typically goes away in a couple of hours. If you find that you are getting upset about a writing topic, simply stop writing, uh, change topics, or use the time to meditate. And we will come back in 10 minutes um, and talk a little bit about what that was, what that was like, if you wanna share. Okay. If you can find a place to land on whatever word you're at. I did my um, writing on the pandemic website and they gave me a little bit of feedback about, um, <clears throat> about the writing, but they really are trying to encourage in that feedback to write meaningfully um, trying to make sense of the experience that you're describing, uh, try to work toward insight, um, express the emotions, and move from what might have started as sort of disorganized into kind of maybe more organization. 
uh, they want to encourage people to look inward and do personal writing, uh, write self-reflectively, but also to achieve some distance uh, through the writing. So it's uh, by doing that, you process the process the experience. And they also kind of check uh, and give you feedback on whether the tone is more positive or negative on a kind of a broad spectrum. They say expressive writing can serve as a good way to integrate complex feelings you have about events that can bring a mix of emotions into your life. And then um, I guess I would just in invite you to experiment with other prompts or return to that prompt um, to get the most benefit uh, based on the research to do this for three or four days in a row. And it doesn't have to be more than 10 minutes. So um, I wanted to pause there in my slides that I shared with you. I have further reading, uh, just a couple of things that, that might um, shed more light if you're curious about it. And so I wanna open it up to any responses or questions. I will say uh, I've been aware of this for some time, but I'd never used it, uh, this site. And I, I chose a different topic, but but uh, it was a personal topic that was important, to, is important to me and that I've been stressed about. But I was very surprised at the end. I definitely could, like when I, those the sort of questions, uh, I forget exactly how they were worded, but the questions asking about your stress level. And I really felt, very different um and i kind of didn't really you know when i answered it before i started writing i didn't really think much about it and i just you know i guess i've felt the stress for a long time on this particular topic and but when i at the end uh i did i really felt a real sense of release um i mean the problem's not gone obviously yeah. but um you know just like my just like the feeling of my shoulders as being a little lower as mm. sort of like that felt sense of the moment. And um, so that was surprising. And I think the, I'm interested to know now more about how the feedback is generated at the end. Um, the emotional tone score for me was pretty low. It was 2.6. <laughs> that was interesting. I don't know, but I think too, I was, I was writing about the career topic and the career money topic, and maybe I was being more analytical and using different language, but, but I don't know, maybe I don't also communicate emotions normally any, very well anyway, I'm not sure. So I was wondering that that was a sort of, of a surprise. The rest seemed to make sense, but that I was just curious about. The, the feedback is interesting. I'm not quite sure what their algorithm is either, but I scored pretty low on emotional tone because I tend to be more analytic. And so I've used this as sort of like a biofeedback loop. Like when I went back in and used the prompt again, I tried to to go in the direction that they were suggesting just to see what would happen so that you might find it as a mm. tool. I wouldn't take it so, I wouldn't take it yeah. uh, to heart so much. It's a pretty... Uh, a pretty blunt instrument, but it is useful in general. So, uh, any any last words? Um, I just want to applaud uh, applaud the committee for making the space for this the activities that you've had this semester and for taking care of each other and just saying out loud that we need to to try to be as well as we can be at, together. So I appreciate it.